And so we were working with a Canadian manufacturing company uh, to locate a facility in the city of Danville. The owner and his wife flew into Greensboro, North Carolina, and made their way um, into the city limits. As they drove down Main Street, the couple looked at our downtown. They saw vacancy. They saw blight. They saw no life. The wife looked at her husband and said, I will never live in this community. They turned around and did not invest. That was a huge eye-opener for the city of Danville. What was not paid much attention to before, our downtown, really impacted our ability to recruit new jobs and new investment, new residents into the community. Quality of place mattered, and a downtown mattered. You know, downtowns are the heart of a community. If it's not active and vibrant, if it's not thriving, what does that say about the health of the rest of the community? When I first came to Danville as deputy city manager, uh, when I was interviewing, they gave me a tour of the area. They didn't show me just the great stuff, they showed me some of the not so great stuff. And one of that was driving down Greghead Street. And my thought at the time when I saw buildings that looked like they were about ready to collapse, trees literally growing up through the bricks, and you can see like blossoms on top of the roofs. And I thought, well, when are they gonna tear this down? I mean, this is terrible, this is blight, this is awful. And if we didn't do something, then we were gonna continue to decline. I mean, the, the evidence was there. We have partnered with our colleagues at the Danville Regional Foundation um, who discovered an article that listed the top communities in the United States for foreign direct investment. And Greenville, South Carolina was ranked number one. Greenville has a very similar background. They were a textile community, much like the city of Danville. Uh, but they started redevelopment efforts about 25 years before we did. Uh, and so the Danville Regional Foundation sponsored a See the Possible trip to go and talk to the leadership within Greenville to see how they were so successful in not only recruiting new industry into their community, but building a vibrant and thriving downtown, a downtown that was known as the best practice, that benchmark that all communities should seek after. When we went to Greenville, South Carolina in 2010, what we saw was a region that had made a significant investment in downtown revitalization. And what they showed us was that their workforce really wanted a, a vibrant downtown with good restaurants and cultural activities and loft apartments. And they really opened their playbook. They shared with us best practices, they shared with us what to avoid, um, and they shared with us where we should focus our investments. Uh, but the w number one piece of advice that they provided us was develop a plan master plan near downtown and when you develop that plan you need to stick to that plan. Danville didn't go to Greenville, South Carolina or any of those other communities to try to be that. You know the important thing about downtown revitalization is figure out who you are and be the best that that you can be and that's what they did in Danville. We came back hired consultants to develop a redevelopment plan for the entire district. Uh, actually, at that point in time, our downtown was the Central Business District and the Tobacco Warehouse District. We rebranded it to focus on this wonderful natural asset, the river. So now this officially became the River District. And in 2011, we launched our plan. So not everybody bought on to what we were trying to do. Uh, although it was obvious there was a need that uh, the downtown had to be revitalized in order for us to be successful as a community, not everyone wanted to make the kinds of investments that needed to be made. So there is a cost, of course, to making improvements, uh, but knowing that when you make those costs, you're going to get some kind of return on investment, that actually made things okay. And it was seen over time that it was a great investment. But in the beginning, people saw, okay, this is a lot of money that's being spent. In a community like ours, it's really important to recognize that economic development has changed. And the old model used to be you rec recruit a company and then the company would recruit people to work there. That model's been flipped. And now communities recognize if you recruit bright, talented people who want to live there, then companies will follow. Downtown revitalization has been a central component for us at making this region stickier for bright, talented people. When I first started, I was walking up and down Main Street talking to various businesses, and I happened upon a business owner, and I can't remember who it was, but uh, the comment was made, we've done this before. We've done downtown revitalization. It's never worked. It's not gonna work this time. And I, my response to him was like, well, look around. We've got empty storefronts. We've got blight. 
We have no businesses open along this whole stretch here. That's not working. So we got to do something, right? I mean, if you don't do anything, then you're going to continue having the kind of results that we've been having. One of the hurdles early on um, was helping the people here see the possible, to see what could become of this place, of this downtown region, to see what a vibrant, thriving downtown could mean for everybody across the region. One key element that really helped change the question, changed the, the community's perception of downtown revitalization was uh, when we began uh, improving uh, Main Street, specifically with the demolition of what was the downtown or motor inn. This uh, property was as attractive as the name <laughs> kind of portrays. Uh, it was eight to ten stories tall and just a brick box with exterior entrances into each of the rooms. So it really became this blighted kind of large shadow over our main street. Um, the Danville Regional Foundation provided the city with uh, two grants, one to acquire the property and one to demolish this building um, just to help improve the visibility, the, the visual aesthetics of, of our main street. I would say that was a turning point for the community. They finally saw, they could physically see the conditions of downtown improve as that building came down. We live streamed the demolition and thousands of residents watched that building as it came down. Residents that hadn't come downtown in decades drove downtown just to see this building being demolished. And once it was completed, we held a party a community party where several hundred individuals came to celebrate the fact that this building was gone. Uh, and we partnered with our chamber to bring in an artist to help reimagine how to reuse that site. And today, uh, it's a, a public park. It has uh, a beautiful sculpture on it as part, of our, uh, as part of our arts trail within the River District. It has a beautiful sign that says home, which was once part of the larger Home of Dan River Fabrics sign uh, that was prominent and very, um, uh, very much recognized by local residents. So it's really become this community asset uh, versus a blighted structure. I think one of the smartest things that Danville did, number one, is realize they have a problem. It's easy to put your head in the sand and just hope that things will get better or hope for that next big project, but they really took control in Danville of their situation. As development started happening, as change started happening, people started to buy into that vision and they started to understand their own enlightened self-interest for being a part of that transformation, how this thriving downtown could benefit their quality of life. Whenever you try to create change, and especially transformational change within a community, one, one organization cannot do it alone. It really takes a larger team, and we've been fortunate that partners from the local level all the way up to the federal level have played some role within our redevelopment plan. I don't think this would have worked without the collaboration between the public and the private sector. For the public sector to make the investments in infrastructure, in the streetscaping, in developing strategies um, was really critical. And for the private sector to see those investments, that gave them the confidence that there were going to be opportunities to follow, that people and other businesses were also going to follow these investments by the public sector. So this collaborative nature was really important. Since 2011, we've invested over $52 million on the public side through public improvements. This includes city funding, funding through our industrial development authority, and grants that we've applied for and have been fortunate to receive. This public investment that has set the stage and laid that foundation has resulted in the recruitment and the attraction of private sector investment that has resulted in over $350 million worth of new investment in our community. Blighted structures are now home to uh, over 850 new uh, apartment units. There are a number of new restaurants, retailers, entertainment venues that have opened as a result of the community's investment within their downtown core. I often describe this as Danville didn't get lucky. This is the execution of a deliberate strategy. So to the credit of the city, from the city manager's office, through each department head, through the elected officials, 
they conducted a, a master plan, they funded the plan, and now they've executed the plan. And I think everyone is surprised that the results are greater than we expected a decade ago. There are buildings in our downtown that were rehabbed using historic tax credits that generated about $25,000 in tax revenue each year and now generate almost half a million dollars each year. So the proof is that when we make the right kinds of investments and encourage the right kinds of, uh, of businesses to come locate into our community, that it will build on itself and we will see success. We see people living downtown, we see people working downtown, we see people enjoying just being downtown in, in the space that it is, where 10, 15 years ago, the thought was, don't go downtown, it's scary. Well, now it's go downtown because look how cool it is. Well, I've been in Denver all of my life, and I remember all of the stores that were downtown and how busy it was. My dad and my mom, we used to stay out in the county, and they would actually call it going into town. Yeah. Uh, like on Saturday, we're going into town, and that was a big deal for us. We just, we enjoyed it because downtown was full. We actually own our building, so we decided to invest in where we live. We decided to, you know, we had a cottage bakery. We baked at home, my wife baked at home, and we outgrew, you know, um, the house. So we realized that this was a big project, but, you know, we were grateful that, you know, so many people in the River District, in this area, were willing to take a, you know, a chance with us and to, you know, encourage us to bring a bakery here. I remember we were looking around for places for the gym and there's a few we were looking at that just didn't seem to really fit. And I, I generally wanted to be here, so we're looking around here, of course, and then we popped along this spot. It's just tucked away off of Craghead enough that like, you know, it's, it's a little bit secretive, but um, we're sandwiched right between two apartments. It was like, there's people already there that are gonna be walking by all the time. But we walked through and I was like, this is it. It was just perfect. And I liked the, the old school vibe all the exposed brick and just how everything had kind of a rougher look to it. It was, it was cool. Choosing the River District uh, as, as a place to open up a cultural restaurant and grill, it only made sense. Um, we're downtown. We are uh, an anchor tenant on this side of town, on the Union Street corridor. And when I say an anchor tenant, it means that we're the first. Downtown is becoming a destination. So it doesn't become their destination unless we have good food, unless we have great service, unless we have a great atmosphere, unless we have really good drinks. The River District has a nice vibe to it. Like Danville, it's like you want to just come down here and it's immediately that nice kind of like, you know those signs that say, take a breath, you're home now? It kind of has that feeling like, okay, you're here now, it's good. We got this beautiful old uh, tobacco hogshead warehouse. So it's 7,128 square feet, and it's right next to the historic, um, the historical society, and behind River District Golf and Social. Uh, so it's sort of becoming a little hipster district there. Just a few years ago, well over half of all the antique buildings downtown were vacant. They were boarded up, uh, padlocked with broken glass. Many saw these as symbols of a failed economy and thought they should all be torn down. During that same time, I looked at the buildings very differently. Um, I saw a simple elegance in the urban decay, uh, very much like looking at the ruins of an ancient city and thinking about all of the activity and culture that once happened there. And so looking at the buildings that way makes today very rewarding that those ideas are now mainstream in Danville, that we are saving the buildings, we protect them, celebrate them, and now they're part of our identity. And so rather than just being projects for those who are uh, maybe financially invested downtown, there's 43,000 residents of Danville who are all emotionally invested downtown. The large tobacco companies started moving out of Danville. They've made their general headquarters in other cities. And so they were leaving monstrous buildings here in Danville that uh, really nobody wanted. Uh, the upkeep on them would be just too much. So my father had the insight uh, to go ahead and buy these buildings from the tobacco companies. And, uh, and our business kept expanding, kept growing. So when we were approached in 2002, 
I think about one of our buildings on Bridge Street, about the possibility of buying it so that they could make apartments out of it. Uh, we were eager to pursue that because this particular building, you couldn't do anything without the use of the elevator. And so uh, once they made us an offer and we decided it was a feasible uh, direction for us to go, uh, that, uh, that pretty much got the ball rolling. It didn't steamroll though. Uh, it didn't happen, you know, one, one month, one the next month, you know, offers. We had 14 different buildings. We started looking at the feasibility of selling more and more of the buildings that we had that were multi-storied and looking elsewhere at Danville, trying to find buildings that were all on one floor. It was so funny back then. Uh, my father, who uh, really thought that the only good ideas came out of his head, uh, when he was approached by these buildings, when uh, about selling these buildings, and when I sat down and talked with him about it, his favorite phrase was, this is the dumbest idea I've ever heard of. But once we got it going, once he saw what was done in the first building, and in the second building, and in the third building, and he started to visualize what it could mean for the uh, downtown area. One of the railroad trestles, they closed it off and then started constructing the walking trail. Um, he began to see the feasibility of all of it and uh, he changed his tune pretty quickly. I've visited very dynamic communities uh, that, that are very proud of themselves and do a great job promoting their cities and celebrating. And very often I could observe that they have fewer assets with which to work than Danville. And so that just described potential or opportunity. I think it is the heartbeat of the city now. Uh, because where the businesses may come to visit the industrial park, uh, citizens don't go to industrial parks unless they work there. Uh, and so they appreciate uh, all of the, the benefits that the River District has added. And, and so we had to take the risk. And thankfully, you know, eight years from, that, from then, uh, we're seeing a downtown that's won the Great American Main Street Award and has been recognized multiple times with awards for how successful it's been. We are so excited that the River District Association was able to bring home a Great American Main Street Award to Danville. But it's fantastic to be able to get that recognition from the outside of how far we've come in such a short time, comparatively speaking. So we've been focused so much on getting more growth, not only in our downtown and our River District, but also throughout the city, that we're actually starting to see that growth and there's more demand on housing and the cost of things are going up a little bit. So now we have a new challenge. We have the challenge of growth, which is a great challenge to have, except you have to be proactive with that as well. So you have to think about how do you bring people along? You know, this community um, has folks in here that uh, we want to have a part of this new economy. So when prosperity comes to Danville, it should be shared. I have the, the mindset that now Danville will be known as a big city, yeah. you know what I'm saying? We've always been, where's Danville? You know, we've never heard of that. Well, we feel like what's getting ready to happen, everybody's gonna hear about Danville, Virginia. So very similar to my childhood, uh, it, it's uh, still a place you go for socialization, um, but slightly different now, it's a lot more vibrant, it's a lot, a lot more energetic. Um, and and uh, what's unique about it is that uh, as much of a gathering place as it was then, uh, it, it serves as a different type of gathering place now uh, with, with it being uh, much more vibrant. I grew up here. I grew up in a community where average was good enough and now that's no longer the standard. Uh, this community, it, it, we've raised the bar. We, this community wants more. It deserves more. It will have more.